It's great to be here, and this is Jaden. Jaden, wave to everybody. Uh, yeah, uh, that's his, you got to clap for him too, because yeah. <laughs> he likes that, and uh, you'll hear me say that in one of the videos. So what we're going to do is we're going to basically, I'm not really a lecturer per se. I'm, I'm basically going to stand up here in front of you for the next uh, hour or so, and then we'll do some Q&A, and I'm just going to show you videos of my kids. So um, it's, uh, it, it's pretty easy stuff from my standpoint. I'm going to share a few stories as we go through. Uh, maybe at the end, Jaden will give some high fives. He loves to give high fives, so I'm going to give you all a warning right now. Uh, when he gives high fives, he will probably have to get everybody in the room. And as he gives them, he gets more and more intense. So if you're uh, towards the end of the line and you're not paying attention, your glasses will probably get knocked off, so, so pay attention. Um, he, uh, he loves people. And Jaden, he's, uh, he's kind of my, my super secret weapon in a sense. I'm naturally a fairly shy guy and I, I picked politics for some reason as, uh, um, as, as what I want to do with my life over the last 13 years. And Jaden oftentimes will come to events and he'll go around and give high fives and I'll just walk around and kind of follow Jaden. People get a chance to know Jaden and I'll just introduce myself as Jaden's dad uh, after he's given someone a high five. And he, he loves to go to those things and he really is an icebreaker. And so I, I choose this quote to kind of start things with because uh, I'm always amazed at the connection that Jaden has. He's nonverbal um, in many ways, like a three or four year old in a 23 year old's body. And yet he has this amazing ability to connect with people. And the first video of the six videos that I'm going to show you, most of them go in chronological order, but this is actually the, the last uh, or the latest of the, the six videos that I'm going to show, I'm going to lead with. And it goes back about a year and a half ago. Um, we're in the basement, um, Janae and Jaden are, are over, they, they live with their mom, but uh, when we're together, uh, um, we're often watching movies or doing something in the basement. And, and since Jaden was about two years old, I've, I've sung the same song to him. And so Janae pulled out her iPhone and decided to tape it this one time, and it's about 35 seconds long. And when I posted the video, Jaden's singing along with me, uh, it got 1.4 million views on Facebook. So uh, it kind of went viral. And I think the reason that it went viral is because people are able to connect and uh, people are able to um, re really sort of see Jaden and you sort of see him one way and then you get a chance to see a video like this and think he's, he is thinking or connecting at a little bit different level than what we might expect. So what you'll notice is Jaden singing along with me in his own way, just because it might be hard to understand the words to the song. I'll just quickly go through them with you. They go, think of me every day, hold tight to what I say, and I'll be close to you even from far away. Know that wherever you are, it is never too far. When you think of me, I'll be with you. And you think about that in the context of me having a job where I'm traveling all the time, and before that working for the Oilers, a job where I was away at hockey games many nights and didn't get a chance to see Jaden before he went to sleep. And so this was a song I sung to him before we ever knew he had autism. And it's only in the last couple of years that he started singing it back along with me. Okay, ready? Look at my eyes. Good job. That was nice. And so, uh, so after I posted that, actually on uh, on Facebook, uh, got many comments, many shares. But one of the first comments I got was from somebody on the autism spectrum who commented, "Wow, you have a lot of remotes." So <laughs> you can see on the side we have. I think there's about eight remotes there, and I have no idea what uh, what almost any of them do. So. Um, Jaden's reading my notes over here. I'm not reading my notes, but Jaden's going to keep me on script here. So, um, the next video, I'm going to jump right into the second video right away. So now we're going to go back in time to 2010, and we had done some. I was elected in 2006, not because I was, uh, you know, not because of autism as an issue, but more because I was interested in sort of fiscal issues and those kind of things. Uh, being a, a good conservative, um, David talked about uh, me getting reelected because I'm because I'm good at what I do. I, I represent a very conservative 
conservative part of the country. Think of t the Texas of Canada in terms of Alberta. So I think I get reelected more because of that than anything else. But um, but uh, the next video, it was a sort of a couple years in. I realized you know we have this unique platform and uh, and and a unique story. And we had a conversation with uh, I had a conversation with Jaden's mom about sort of sharing that story a little bit and sort of realized that we could do more with the platform we had than just the typical political stuff. And so this is an interview we did around World Autism Awareness Day, and uh, it was the first live interview that we've done. And for those of you that uh, work in the autism field or have loved ones with autism, you can imagine that that could be a little bit risky. And so when we were about to go live, just as we were kind of planning it, I, I said to Tom, the guy that was going to interview us, I said, Tom, uh, you know, anything can happen. Let's be prepared for sort of the uh, unpredictable, and we'll just power through no matter what happens. And sure enough, about five to 10 seconds before we went live, Tom, just uh, in the course of just the regular uh, conversation, uh, just before we started, Jaden's sitting right beside me, Tom says, thanks, thanks for changing your travel plans to be here today. And Jaden is obsessed with travel, and he's obsessed with plans. In fact, he spent a good part of the afternoon with Tammy and, and with my girlfriend, Julie, at the train museum today and had a great time at the train museum. So he's obsessed with these things. And so when Tom said that, Jaden had to know what was going on. Now, we're doing a live interview in the foyer of the House of Commons, which is completely made of stone. Um, the acoustics in there are, are uh, very echoey, and you'll, you'll hear this. Jaden had to know what was going on, and this is the result of uh, that question. Welcome back to Power Play. I'm Tom Clark. Well, there are a number of stories around this place that very rarely get into the papers. We're going to introduce you now to just one of them. Mike Lake, Member of Parliament, Conservative Member of Parliament, and his son, Jaden. Now, Mike has been a champion of the cause to find a cure for autism. As you can tell, Jaden uh, suffers from autism. I'll explain actually here quickly. Please go a, ahead, yeah. A little explanation. I just mentioned that we had switched from uh, taking a, uh, a train, which we were going to take, yes. to a, a plane when we decided to come on the show. And uh, he is very um, uh, tied to his schedule and likes to know exactly what's going on. So I made the mistake of mentioning that to you as we were starting the interview, and, uh, and Jaden caught on and wants to hear a little bit more about it. So, uh, okay. yeah. Uh, tell me something, uh, Mike, about. Uh, what it's like bringing up Jaden in your family and, and, and what that's meant to you. you know, it's a, I'll just explain. We're, we're going to take at 7 o'clock, we're going to take a plane ride, okay? At 7 o'clock. What it's been, what it's like is, uh, it's, it's interesting. He's, he's an amazing kid. We go through moments like this sometimes. Yep. And uh, uh, it's unscripted. This is why one of the things that I always suggest to parents when they're talking about their kids with autism and trying to get across what autism is, is to take their, take their child and meet their elected officials, their, their member of parliament, their MLAs. Um, don't be afraid, I always say to them, and this is a real life example, don't be afraid of taking your child in to meet them. And they say oftentimes, well, what if my child acts up? How am I supposed to ex properly explain? And I say, if, you're, if your child acts up and acts like he, has, he or she has autism, you've explained it better than you could possibly explain it with words. Right, don't right? hide them. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Don't hide them. So one of the things that actually about that clip is you're watching that clip, and I do this presentation a lot for university students across the country and really around the world, but one of the things that you'll notice when you watch the clip is, uh, and it, it provides a good explanation um, when I'm talking to students, is the language that Tom uses. This is 2010, and you'll notice that he talks about a cure and then talks about Jaden suffers with autism, right? Two things that we would never say today, and most of you in the room, I see a lot of people nodding in the room. But of course, 2010 was a little bit different. We used language that was a little bit different back then. Lots of people did, and we've modified that like we do with a lot of things. Um, I always say cut people a little bit of slack. We live the world of autism, and, and uh, those of you that are parents, we live 24-7. Of course, many people here work. You're more sensitive to those things, but Tom is doing a great job He's chosen to have us on the show, and he's trying to use his platform to help us raise awareness, and not everybody's going to get it perfect all the time, and he doesn't live with people with autism, doesn't live uh, the issue day in and day out like we do, so uh, we often want to kind of cut people a little bit of slack, and there's another example, another interview that I'm going to show you in a little while. Um, the next video that I'm going to show, though, is following up on that, um, I made a few statements in the House of Commons, and in 2012, 
had the opportunity. Autism Speaks, uh, Bob Wright had, had seen one of the statements I'd done in the, in the House of Commons. And in 2012, he called up and he wanted Jaden and I to come and speak to the spouses of world leaders at the UN General Assembly uh, in New York. And so we had the opportunity to go out there and do that. And when we did that, I chose this quote leading into it because uh, for most of us, this piece of advice is really good advice, right? Um, you don't always wear your heart on your sleeve, right? If you're going into a job interview and you're not feeling very good that day, you're not gonna wear that expression on your face. Um, you're not always gonna say everything that's on your mind. If someone asks you to go through a list of your strengths or your weaknesses, you're not gonna go through that list. But for someone with autism, that's difficult. For Jaden, that's difficult. But for someone you know, who's verbal, for example, doing a job interview can be a real challenge. Um, that question, what are, you, uh, what are you good at, could lead to a 45 minute conversation about things you know, in detail that someone's good at. And that context might be difficult. For Jaden, what that looks like is, for Jaden, he, he wears his heart on his sleeve all the time. So the expression that's on his face right now tells me that he's, he's had a long day today. Um, he's a little bit tired, he's not as happy as sometimes he is, and he'll wear that expression on his face, whatever it is that he's feeling at, at a given point in time. The interview that I'm gonna show you next, I wanna give you a little bit of context to. So, it's four, at four o'clock in the morning we woke up in Ottawa, and uh, we put Jaden in a suit. At the time, uh, I think he was wearing a tie in the interview, so um, doesn't love wearing a suit. I don't love wearing a suit either. And uh, you know, so we put him in a suit, we hop in a cab, we go to the airport, we, in Canada, when you're coming this direction, you have to go through customs in, in Canada. So we go through security, we go through customs, we hop on a plane, fly to New York, get off the plane, hop in a cab in New York, which is a harrowing experience at the best of times, um, and uh, get to where we're going, where they're hosting this event, do a, an interview for the CBC National News, so our national broadcaster, we do an interview with them first, and then we do this interview for CNN. And so we're already six or seven hours into the day, and this has been our day so far, and Jaden's already tired, and Jaden's anxious in mornings at the best of times. And so you'll notice when you're watching this video, and those of you in the room, you, you'll key in on this fairly quickly, but when I'm talking to intro psych students who have no experience with autism, it's really a good illustration. You, because Jaden's nonverbal, and even because though he writes and can use a computer to communicate, he doesn't communicate abstract things very well, like feelings and, and, and emotions and those kind of things. He can you know, communicate concrete things really well. Um, you kind of have to read his skin tone. And you're gonna see in the video, um, you're gonna see Jaden's skin tone is a little bit off. You'll see that his eyes are more watery. You'll see that he's swallowing a little bit more, right? And you can tell that he's off a little bit. Those are all things that we have to watch every day with Jaden in the absence of normal communication that, uh, you know, with someone that can tell you how they're feeling at any given time. We actually took a time out in the middle of the interview, and you'll see in the, in, in the story that we're throwing a football back and forth, but that was actually a, a break in the interview because Jaden finds throwing a football really therapeutic. He finds the feeling of the football. You like football? Yeah, he like finds the, the feeling of the football, the leather, the smell of the football, the motion, throwing it back and forth. You can't hear it, but we're counting as we throw it back and forth, which is also therapeutic for him. And then we went back and finished the interview, and this is what it looked like in the end. 16-year-old Jaden Lake has autism. When he was 11, I remember my, my wife phoning me and saying, Jaden just kissed me for the first time. Jaden, can you give me a kiss on the cheek? Took him till he was 11 years old to learn how he wants to do it again. He's the son of Mike Lake, a Canadian MP who's in New York this week to raise awareness about the disorder, which afflicts one of every 88 children in the United States. He doesn't know how to be mean to anybody. He doesn't know what bullying is. He doesn't know when people are even being mean to him. In the shadow of the United Nations General Assembly, the spouses of leaders from 15 countries gathered this week with Lake to emphasize that autism is a pressing threat to global health. Some countries like, like mine, we don't know anything about autism and how it is affecting the, the children of the world. The disorder most often targets boys and its overall numbers have been going up. Ba, ba, ba. <gasps> yeah, what are you thinking about right now? What are you thinking about right now? I bet you're thinking about football probably, right? But whether the rising prevalence is due to better reporting or reflects an actual increase isn't clear. Just as mysterious, it's cause and whether it can be cured. Now when he starts laughing, it's one of the most incredible mm -hmm. sounds in the world when he gets the giggles. And you'll just look at him, yeah, you know it too, right? You know we love it. And you just, uh, you, yeah, I'll just look at him and go, what's so funny? And it's such a mystery because I have no idea what it is that's making him laugh at the time. 
People like Lake say early detection is key and that it's important to recognize that there are ways to help. His son both cooks and works at a library. He, he's very, very good at sorting the books. He loves to, you like the library? You like to put, scan the books in the computer and then put them on, sort them into piles and then you like to run them out and put them on the shelves, right? David Ariosto, yeah. CNN, New York. Crazy with that cart. So you see what I'm talking about with the expressions and sort of see how tough it is to, to read those things with Jaden. So for Jaden, when we think about challenges um, that he faces, and really when, when we think about Jaden's future, you know, challenges are not defining for Jaden. They're just things that we need to overcome to unlock potential. And you're going to see examples in the next three videos about what Jaden's good at and the power of inclusion and what he has to contribute and those kind of things. But in order to unlock that potential, we have to mitigate some challenges. So for Jaden, you saw kind of the expressions and, and the idea of kind of mitigating challenges with communication of emotions. But think about how that abstract um, can also be challenge, challenging when you think about danger, for example. Jaden has real difficulty understanding danger. So um, he doesn't understand traffic at all. You can teach him to look left, to look right, and then to cross. You can teach him an order. That's very concrete. But he is a, it's impossible for him right now to understand how fast a vehicle's coming and how much that vehicle would hurt him if it hit him and those kind of things. Those are too abstract for him. So he'll just look left, look right, and cross to go where he wants to go. Jaden loves dogs. We talked about that. You'll see it a little bit more in, in some of the other stuff we're going to show. But he loves dogs to the extent where he literally, if he saw a dog, German Shepherd, strange German Shepherd standing right over there, he would run up to it squealing as loud as he can because he's super happy to see and really excited about the dog. And what's he like about dogs? He likes everything sensory. So he likes the smell of the breath. So he's going to throw his face right in the face of the German Shepherd. He's going to be making noise while he does it. He wants the dog to lick him. So if the dog doesn't lick him right away, he's going to push his face right up against the mouth to try and make the dog lick him. It's probably not the result he's going to get. And, uh, and, and while he's doing that, he likes the squishiest parts of the dog, so he's going to reach for the most sensitive parts of the dog and he's going to squeeze, like he'd squeeze a stress ball, right? Because Jaden loves those feelings. You can understand the danger in that because he doesn't understand the danger of that um, until he gets bit. And for some reason, Jaden doesn't totally equate. He's got his own little dog that nips him from time to time. And seemingly, he doesn't understand that that's going to happen again the next time because he, he gets, uh, from time to time, gets nipped on the nose a few times from Koji. But he loves Goji still and continually goes back. Sometimes the stories are kind of funny. So um, Jaden doesn't really, when he wants something, he just goes and gets it. So you know, even when he was two or three years old, you'd be walking through a restaurant. And he'll grab someone's beer off their table as you're walking through a restaurant, take a sip of the beer. He's thirsty. There's a drink there. And he wants it. And he'll take a sip. He didn't like beer very much. But uh, um, he would do that. He would, he would literally grab a chicken wing off somebody's table as he's walking by. And uh, yeah, even last night we were at dinner with uh, David and Tammy and Jaden likes salt and he'll dump salt on the table and then he'll just lick it and eat salt off the table. So you kind of got to watch sometimes. Um, when he was about nine years old, we went to McDonald's um, at West Edmonton Mall. So West Edmonton Mall is one of the biggest malls in the world. Uh, between Christmas and New Year's, it probably as busy as a McDonald's can be. And you've probably been to busy McDonald's. So there's 70 or 80 people in line we're at McDonald's, Jaden looks like any other kid. We're getting food for a bunch of people, so I've got all the food in my hand and we're walking out of the McDonald's. And Jaden gets this smile on his face and he starts to giggle and my hands are full, I'm not holding his hand like I normally would, and I know I'm in trouble. And uh, he runs back to the counter and he's really excited, so he's squealing. So now everybody in the McDonald's is staring at him. And he runs behind the counter, runs the full length of the counter, pushing everybody that's working there out of his way as he runs. And he reaches into the bin where they hold the crushed Smarties, which are like M&Ms, right, for McFlurries, grabs a handful of crushed Smarties out of this bin and just shoves them in his face. So he's got a ring of colored crushed Smarties around his face and the biggest smile you've ever seen as he's eating these Smarties. And of course, everybody is just staring and looking. And I just find someone uh, you know, who looks like a manager at McDonald's and explain quickly that he has autism. And, and you walk out and you kind of go on with your day. Um, but those kind of occurrences, they happen on a fairly regular basis, right around the same time we were at an Oilers game and I'm working, I'm the director of ticket sales for the Oilers and we're sitting in our seats, I'm wearing my suit and my Oilers ID and Jaden's beside me. And again, lets out a really excited squeal, reaches over the shoulder of a five-year-old girl in front of him 
and grabs the ice cream off the top of her cone like you'd grab a, a snowball. I don't know if you guys know what snowballs are. <laughs> you, don't, you don't get very much snow here. Um, Tammy was describing building a snowman when there was snow here one time yesterday and she was using hand motions to describe what the, and her, she was talking about building a snowman and her hands were like this big and I said, that's uh, how big your snowmen are in uh, Sacramento. Our snowmen are a little bit bigger in Edmonton. But uh, uh, anyway, he grabs the ice cream off the top of this girl's cone and shoves it in his mouth and he's just basically eating the ice cream out of his hand. It's dripping down through his fingers and got the biggest smile on his face. And I just, again, said to the dad, you know, sorry about that, he has autism, and the dad understood right away, but the girl did not understand at all. <laughs> so, um, but uh, that's life. And sometimes, um, you know, I talked about, you know, him being kind of, uh, you know, he, 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 an icebreaker of sorts. Uh, when he was 17 years old, uh, he goes a lot of places with me, and we get a chance to go to a lot of events, and he loves going to events, and he loves to meet new people. He loves to give his high fives, and we were at the National Governors Association meeting, so, um, summer meeting, we're in Wisconsin meeting American governors. Uh, I was a Canadian representative for my party there. And we got a chance to meet, had dinner with Mary Fallon. So she was the governor of Oklahoma at the time. And they really hit it off. And so over dinner, um, you know, they, 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 she sat and talked to him and showed a real interest in him. And then a couple hours later, we saw her again across the room at a reception. And I said, Jaden, go, go see Mary. And Jaden goes running across this, it was actually a tent, because it was like an outdoor reception, quite humid out that night. And Jaden goes running across, and he's squealing, he's super happy to go see Mary, or so I thought. But instead of going to see Mary, he runs to the guy that she's with. And uh, I thought he was just gonna give Mary a hug, but he, she, he runs up to the guy that she's with, and he gives him a hug. Now this guy's never met Jaden. Not only does he give him a hug, he throws his face into the guy's neck, and he starts to smell and kiss the guy's neck. Because um, Jaden loves the feeling of skin, and the guy's got his shirt undone a little bit more than I do right now, because it was a pretty hot night. And probably wearing some kind of cologne that Jaden liked the smell of, and complete stranger. And I race up and I explain again that Jaden has autism. Well, it turns out that this guy is a senior advisor in the Obama White House, a senior policy advisor, and we wind up having a half hour conversation about trade and autism. A conversation that I would never have had except for Jaden breaking the ice and making that introduction. So, um, so it's, it's, it's pretty cool sometimes and, and I wish that I had half of the courage that Jaden has sometimes and half of the honesty and authenticity that Jaden has. Um, when I talk to students, I, you know, I, I often kind of break in this part of the conversation and just kind of tell them, here's what I want you to understand. As 18 year olds sort of gonna go out into a variety of, uh, of jobs in the world, you know, uh, here's what I hope that you'll take away from, from the presentation. I hope that you'll understand um, in early intervention is important. That's one of the, the three things, and I'm not gonna get into detail on those because everybody in the room gets this. Um, I talk about the fact that transitions uh, matter a lot and can't be arbitrary, and then I get into kind of some of the different transition points. And the third thing that I, that I hammer home with them is that we need to expect more of people with Jaden, and that's really the title of the presentation. Jaden has a lot to contribute, but so often we're so focused on the challenges that we miss the incredible opportunities and the incredible skills and abilities. Um, I'll use that time that I would normally expand on those things just to say this to this crowd, because it's a little bit of a different group here. Um, we're also working at a global level to try and reach out to organizations and start what we kind of envision as a global autism partnership. And one of the things that we've kind of found as we have conversations with stakeholders, with self-advocates, with families, with researchers, with the broader community, no matter where it is that we're having this conversation, is that there's common themes almost across the board that we come across. And way too often, the autism community is divided and sort of focused on whatever this organization's focused on or this organization's focused on or what stage of life you're at if you're a self-advocate or if you're a family living with someone with autism. And, uh, and we don't sit down and have a conversation and find out sort of what it is that we agree on. And when we have that conversation about what we agree on, we identify that the, there is common ground around a set of about seven or eight different things. Um, early intervention that I talked about, you know, education, diagnosis, of course, earlier than that, uh, oftentimes earlier than that, um, vocation, housing, research, transitions, awareness. Those are pretty much, you almost talk to any group of people around a table and you can consolidate um, the, the uh, issues that we're dealing with into those sort of categories. And so as we have a conversation about a, a global partnership of sorts, working with organizations like not only 
autism organizations like uh, the Autism Society of America, Autism Speaks, the National Autistic Society in the UK, Autism Europe, and, and having those types of conversations, but also now having conversations with the UNICEFs and Save the Children's and Plans and World Visions and, uh, and the Global Partnership for Education, which is a massive uh, international organization, I think $3 billion, uh, uh, led by Madeleine Albright's daughter, Alice Albright. Um, you know, when we start talking to these international organizations focused in all of these areas, we want to we want to encourage them to have an awareness of autism and sort of a um, an orientation within their group that kind of focuses on on skills and abilities and inclusion and unlocking the potential that we're talking about. So this is sort of what we're working on at a global level. I don't often share that with the classes because I'm so focused on what I want them to kind of understand about autism, but you guys kind of get that. So. I want you to know a little bit about what we're working on when we're talking to folks. I'm gonna jump now into sort of the, the, the last three videos of the presentation. After that, we're gonna have some time for some questions and answers, but I talk about potential, and I talk about what Jaden has to contribute. In order for us to get to that point, the point where we're talking about that, that potential and locking it, we have to include them. We have to get to know them. And uh, inclusion, one of the things I always say is inclusion can't be an end. Too often we talk about inclusion, that seems to be our end goal. But if you think about it, my goal for Jaden, and I don't think Jaden himself is very happy if all he does is an endless series of field trips for the rest of his life doing things that he likes to do and being included. He has skills to offer and he's happiest when he's contributing something. The first video that I'm going to show you of the last three is an example of inclusion. And what I want you to get from that is as you watch it, I want you to see a kid that's in a school system. He's in grade 11 at this point. Um, in his grade 10 year, uh, one of the teachers and some of the students started to ask, okay, what, and he's in a K to 12 school, so he's been in the same school for all of these years. They started to ask, what could we include Jaden in? What does he like to do that we could include him in and, uh, and challenge him with? And they put him into musical theater. They realized that Jaden loves movies, he loves music. He's loved the sound of music since he was a little kid. He's probably watched it 200 times. That's about 199 times too many to watch The Sound of Music. I've seen it many times now. Um, Jaden has watched Sound of Music so many times that he can, he'll put his finger on a random point in the screen, and it took us a while to figure out what the heck he was doing. So his finger's on like a random point on the screen, and what we realized is that whenever the scene changed, the person who was singing would be in that exact spot where his finger was when the scene changed uh, as he was watching Sound of Music. So he loved these things and the school kind of knew this and they thought, well, let's include him in that. And so the first year um, that he was in it, they did Oliver. And there's some group scenes in Oliver and they included Jaden in a couple of group scenes. He was a 1800s uh, street person. His face was dirty and he would mill about on the, on the stage with, uh, with the other characters. And, uh, that was the extent of his inclusion. And you wouldn't know it if you were watching it. You wouldn't know that Jaden was any different from anybody else, except if you knew he was in the play and you were watching him, he was the one person who wasn't faking like they were talking to someone else. He was just standing there staring at his grandmother in the middle of the crowd. And, uh, and so that was the first year. And then the second year, Global TV, uh, a, a local TV station, came out and did a story on him being included in Bye Bye Birdie. And as you'll see in this clip, they kind of took it to another level of inclusion for Jaden and really challenged him some more. Millwood's Christian School debuts Bye Bye Birdie at the Paramount Theatre in just under an hour. In the musical, a rock star named Conrad Birdie is the fan favorite, but in real life, it's Jaden Lake, a nonverbal student with an important message for his castmates. Laurel Clark explains why. <laughs> The cast members of Bye Bye Birdie loosen their vocal cords with a classic scale. But their rehearsal isn't complete without one more exercise, a run they've come to know as Jaden's warm up. They sing Ba 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 because it's the only sound 17 year old Jaden makes. The grade 11 student has autism and is non verbal. Let's face it, including a, uh, a kid with autism in the musical theater uh, performance is a risk for them. I mean, everybody wants that performance to be perfect, mm -hmm. right? And when you include Jaden in there, you run the risk that he's going to squeal at an inopportune time because he's so excited to be there or that he's going to start to wander off the edge of the stage somewhere because he sees something that's interesting. That hasn't happened. In fact, you only need to watch one number to see Jaden is like any other cast member. He 
he's just performing with the help of a buddy system. We just uh, hold his hand um, to guide him which place to go, and um, if he's going off somewhere, we watch over him. And uh, yeah, he's like a brother. Jaden has always loved music. The sound of music is one of his favorites. He doesn't sing, but his mom says musical theater plays to other strengths. Because he um, loves routine, you've memorized a pattern for you know how they take him on stage, how they take him off stage. That makes him thrive. He loves order and pattern. And his visual memory is so strong, choreographers know once they teach Jaden certain steps, they can't make any changes. Whatever you teach Jaden, you're not going to be able to go back and say, hey, by the way, can you now do this? Because that first thing that we teach him is the thing that sticks in his mind. Jaden's parents see changes in him, how content he is being part of the cast. I think he just loves being part of a group of kids. You know, everybody likes to be part of a group even if they can't verbalize it, right? Being part of the group, Jaden is enhancing his peers' performance too. He's a fun person to be with. Um, he also encourages the other casts, just high-fiving everyone. And so, in just a few months, without singing a single word, Jaden has taught these students something his teacher wants them to remember long after curtain call. They can just stop and go, you know what, there is a value to absolutely every person. And when you accept someone unconditionally, you allow them to shine too. Laurel Clark, Global News. Hmm. Aww. A Bye Bye Birdie shows at the Paramount Theatre tonight and tomorrow at 7 p.m. Well worth seeing, obviously. There oh, was a yeah. lot of awes during that story. Yeah. That's yeah. so well done. Great job, Laurel. <laughs> and a great story about teen spirit and how mm -hmm. teens come together yeah. and help great each other. Great attitude. Yeah. Yeah, really awesome. sweet. Thanks, Celine. Right, thank you, Celine. Thanks. It's kind of cool when you watch that. And to think about in his grade 12 year, so the next year after this, they did Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. And they took it to even another level. Um, one of the girls who was in her last year of musical theater decided to ask if Jaden could be her husband in the play. And if you know that play at all, there's 12 couples who, a lot of dance scenes, a lot of choreography. And she modified all of the dance scenes so that it looked like Jaden was doing what everybody else was doing. So when the other boys put their hands on the girl's hips and threw them in the air, she had Jaden put his hands on her hips, lift his hands up, and then she jumped to make it look like he was lifting her up and did the same moves. And it was amazing to see what Jaden was able to do as part of that performance. But as you're watching that, the inclusion is fantastic, but it's also okay to watch that. I give you permission as Jaden's dad to watch it and say, Jaden probably isn't gonna have a career in musical theater. That's okay to admit that. He, that the thing that you don't wanna miss though is the fact that he's unbelievably better than what you thought he was gonna be. And every year they challenged him. And the benefit to that, and, and I wanna add a little bit of a caveat to that because it's easy to think that um, there's no chance that someone like Jaden could have a career in musical theater, but I, I think that there, there are people with autism and, and a lot of people with autism who are now advocating for the fact that when characters in a play or in a TV show or a movie have autism, it would be better if they were played by somebody with autism. And I think there's a relevance to that and that's a conversation that we need to have. Um, in Jaden's case, that's probably not where his career is gonna be, but because these kids have shown such an interest in him, They've gotten to a chance over the years to also see what he was good at. So they've challenged him. He's taken a part in things. They like him. They, he's got friends. Um, and these are people that have gone to school since he was really young with him. They remember that Jaden was the first kid done his times tables. And he never made mistakes in grades one to four when, or whatever grades people do their times tables. Um, when it come to, came to spelling tests, he got 100% on most of his spelling tests. Once he saw words, he could remember how to, to spell them. Uh, when he does a word search. He loves doing word searches. Right now he's not doing word searches on his phone, but sometimes he'll just do them on his phone. He's faster than I would be doing a word search. He sees things a little bit differently. When he was too young to know his alphabet, like younger than most kids know their alphabet, um, you know the, the foam frames with letters that you or your kids learn the alphabet on? We were at an Oilers game one night, and this friend took up the pile of letters and piled them up and took the frame away. Jaden had never done it without a frame and this friend put the A down, and Jaden proceeded to put the alphabet in order faster than I would have been able to put the alphabet in order. And it was like in this jumble of letters, it's like almost like he could see where the letters were and knew exactly where to put his hand to grab them, to put them in order, which was amazing already. And then this friend on a whim just piled back the letters, piled up the letters again, and grabbed the, the Z, we say Z in Canada, grabbed the Z, put that down, and Jaden put them in backwards order as fast as he put them in forwards order, having never done that before. 
It was absolutely amazing, and from time to time, uh, we've done it. We haven't done it that many times, but from time to time, if you, if you were to write a, a Z down right now, Jaden would proceed to just write the alphabet in backwards order. So he sees things differently. So you start to ask, okay, well, where can we use these skills? What can Jaden contribute um, where he'll be able to use these skills? And so the next year, in Jaden's grade 12 year, CTV came out, uh, and for their national news, did this story that highlights uh, an area where Jaden can contribute, and it really provides an insight into you know, what Jaden's career might look like down the road and uh, what opportunities there might be. Now that stigma often follows children into adulthood, holding them back from their full potential. But the tide may be turning. Tonight we have the story of one young man who shows what can be achieved if given a chance. Here's CTV's Alberta Bureau Chief, Janet Dirks. When it comes to putting away library books, Jaden Lake leaves others in the dust. Jaden, can you do these ones too? He's not just fast, he's accurate. He's better than us at most of these tasks. He just knows exactly where everything goes and how to do it. Jaden has autism. He was diagnosed when he was two. Now 19, he volunteers at this school library in Edmonton. While he's nonverbal, he's an enthusiastic worker. Do you like working in the library, Jaden? Jaden also catalogs and labels and works with computers. He could work um, in an office or a bank or, you know, anywhere where there is numbers and organization. He's excited to work. He's excited to uh, keep working. Jaden's father is Edmonton MP Mike Lake. He wants employers to give adults with autism a chance. He wouldn't be able to do a job interview. Uh, that would be a challenge for him. So uh, if he wanted to work in a library or a warehouse or somewhere where he would be able to use these skills, he would need somebody to help him. He would need somebody to communicate for him and explain what it is that he's good at. Research shows adults with autism spectrum disorder are underemployed. An Ontario study revealed only 13% work full-time. Just 6% have part-time jobs. In Calgary, Garth Johnson wants to change that. His company connects businesses with adults with autism in software and web website testing. Dedication, commitment, um, focus, um, they will do this job like, again and again and again for a long time, a lot longer than we would do jobs and still love it. Advocates for people with autism say it's not about charity, it's about creating opportunities and workplaces stand to benefit most of all. Janet Dirks, CTV News, Calgary. So you kind of see the difference there between the video of him in musical theater and that video. And you know, when they came out and did that story, they didn't even capture how amazing it is to watch Jaden in the, in the library. When he's putting books away and he's racing around like you see there, he'll walk by a shelf and suddenly he'll grab a book off the shelf. Jaden notices when books are placed in the wrong spot. As he's walking by, he can identify a book that some student has pulled off the shelf and put in the wrong spot. He'll grab it. He'll kind of put it in his pile, and when he's walking by the spot where that book's supposed to be, he'll just pull it out of the, wherever he put it and put it on the shelf. And uh, it is amazing to, to watch. The other thing, too, when you're watching that video, to notice is his facial expressions when he's there. His expression is very similar to the CNN video. So the CNN video, he was a little bit off or whatever. Don't mistake that facial expression for this facial expression, which is his game face, right? When you're doing something you love, sometimes you have that same intense look on your face. You don't look necessarily that happy when you're doing something you really, really love, like playing a sport or something like that. That's your game face. Jaden has his game face on there because he loves to work. When he's done working, when he's done doing something like that that he loves to do, um, you think about moving from one house to another a couple of times, he's done that. and you know, emptying boxes and taking things to the rooms where they go. If you tell him he has to stop working, there are times when Jaden will cry because he doesn't want to stop working. So I don't know how many of you cry at the end of your shift, uh, whether it's here or something else, but um, if you don't love your job that much, maybe you should rethink, right? No, Jaden loves, he just loves to work. And, uh, and so, you know, really what I want for Jaden, and I'm sure um, you know, what those people that have surrounded him in the school system and, and, and I know what his mom wants for him. People who love Jaden want him to be happy and they want him to be able to contribute and they want to see his potential realized. And that story is exciting to me, was exciting to me when they did it because it really highlights those, those kind of opportunities for him. And one of the other things that I, I love is the fact that in the sort of journey that I've been on um, in my political life, especially the last 13 years, is I've gotten a chance to uh, do what I do alongside both of my kids to some degree. 
And one of the things that it's kind of taught me is you know, a different way of thinking of things. So for example, talk about it being really easy to underestimate Jaden. It is really easy to underestimate him, and it was easy even for me as a father to underestimate him, but it's not lost on me that what I'm doing right now, standing here talking to you, I couldn't do without Jaden. He's not only inspired me to do it, um, you know, it's his story that's so special, I get a chance to sort of tell it here, and he couldn't do what he does without me, because he needs me to help him, he needs me to, to help to be his voice. So we get a chance to do something that neither of us would be able to do if we didn't do it together, which is pretty cool. And in this video, you get a chance to see, the next video, you get a chance to see my daughter. So my daughter's 19 years, right, 19 years old right now. She's going to University of Alberta, taking a business degree right now. But we did an interview six years ago when she was 13, and that interview, we take a piece of that is in this last video I'm gonna show you. So the video itself is just from a couple of years ago. And uh, it's uh, Jaden and I speaking to a crowd in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And it's 15,000 students in an arena. It's something called We Day. And it's a really cool initiative where they have um, people come in. They have students come in that have earned their way to come to these events. They have musicians come out and sing. So um, at some of the events, they've had Shawn Mendes, I think some of the American events, Demi Lovato. and and others have, have come out and performed, and then they have people speak in between. And Jaden and I had a chance to go to the event in, in Saskatchewan. Um, and with 15,000 kids in an arena, Jaden is not even the least bit nervous. He's just happy to be on stage, happy to be checking out uh, the crowd, taking a look at the teleprompter. He, anytime I, I'm on news and the newscaster's reading a teleprompter or something like that and doing some kind of interview, Jaden's eyes are just laser focused on the teleprompter. So he, he likes those kind of things. Um, and then at the tail end of it, you'll see this, this 45 second clip from this interview that uh, Janae uh, was a part of when uh, she was 13 and, and Jaden was, I think, 16 at the time. And what I love about that clip is the fact that my 13 year old daughter probably uh, gives the best answer to a question that's ever been given in any interview that I've been a part of. Now you know sharing with others is much more than about sharing your own talents. It's about taking the time to discover the talent and the gifts that your peers have as well. So here to tell us more are Edmonton MP Mike Lake and his son Jaden. Give it up! Hey Weede. What a fantastic day. So I'm going to introduce you to Jaden right now and I'm going to let him say hello and then after he does that you have to applaud for him, okay? So say hi to him. Uh -huh. Jaden has autism, and sharing his story around the world is one of the most meaningful things we get to do. Jaden's unique impact can be linked to hundreds of young people like you who've invested in him over 20 years. Jaden's nonverbal, has trouble with abstract concepts. He'll cry when he's sad, or squeal loudly or giggle when he's happy. When something's on his mind, he'll grab my face and inquire with an escalating ba 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 until he gets the explanation he needs to move on with his life. He's obsessed, absolutely obsessed with dogs. <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> to the point where he'll go nose to nose with any dog, regardless of size, something we always have to be aware of. In my annual World Autism Day statement, I mentioned four years ago that Jaden was very much like other 16-year-olds. He loves baking chocolate chip cookies, working in the school library, and bowling with dad on Saturday mornings. Jaden's sister, Janae, was quick to remind me at the time Daddy, no other teenage boy loves doing those things. But Jaden the adult is very much like the Jaden we've known from childhood. Almost inconceivably innocent. For those who don't know him, Jaden's really easy to underestimate. Yet for those who do get to, to know him, Jaden's upside is immeasurable. He's the friend who always believes the best about you. The worker who never wants his shift to end. And the student who makes all of the others better. He's the brother who loves his sister and isn't afraid to show it. And the son who every single day reminds his parents that there's incredible joy to be discovered in even life's most difficult circumstances. Make no mistake, autism and other developmental disabilities come with very real challenges. But as we work together to understand and address those challenges, our country will unearth a, tr a treasure of unique talents and abilities. We just need to take the time to look for them. Now, 
Now here's a clip of Jaden with Janae, who at just 13 years old captured perfectly how we all feel about Jaden. I'm gonna ask you a really hard question here, okay? I know you can handle it, which is why I'm giving you the heads up on it ahead of time. Do you ever sometimes wish that your brother was quote unquote normal, like every other kid? Well, honestly, since Jaden was diagnosed with autism before I was born, I don't exactly know what a normal brother is like. So Jaden kind of is my normal, like having autism and stuff. So I don't really wish that he was normal or anything. You like him the way he is? Mm -hmm. If he was like, if he didn't have autism anymore, or it was like cured or something, he wouldn't be the same as like Jaden was now. So I'll leave, you, I'll leave you with this thought. The more that a normal life for Canadians includes people like Jaden, the more we can work together through the hard stuff and allow every single one of our brothers, sisters, neighbors, and friends to thrive. Uh, thank you so much for including us in your day to day. And as I always do, I'm going to let Jaden have the last word. So say bye bye to everybody. There you go. Thank you. So Julie always harasses me about that last part where I say, I'm going to let Jaden have the last word, then he says bye-bye, and then I say thank you. <laughs> like a typical politician, right? I have to have the last word. So it's been interesting, actually, to watch Jaden um, throughout the part that he's sitting over here because he's been kind of dozing off at times, and then anytime he's on the screen, he wakes up and he's fully attentive. But when I'm speaking, hopefully that's not a metaphor for uh, my presentation, too. But uh, um, anyway. Janae's point there was, um, I think, well taken probably by, by this group. And, and I mean, I think the, the thing that I think about when I'm reflecting on what she says there is that Janae doesn't have, didn't have a choice. So she was born into it. Jaden's three and a half years older than she is. So she didn't have a choice. Her normal included Jaden because she was born into the family she was born into. But the school that they went to did have a choice. And that school chose to include Jaden, chose to assign a full-time aide to him and chose to have him in a regular classroom. And while we thought that when we were putting him in that situation and kind of working and pushing the school to do that, we thought that that was because it would be better for Jaden. If you talk to the kids in his grad class, if you talk to all of the kids in his school, regardless of grade, every single one of them would say that their life is better for having had Jaden be a part of it, right? Um, they learned more because Jaden was a part of their life. Their normal has included Jaden and their perspective is different because of that. And if you think about life in general, our, our, our normal is better when our life includes people around us who are different from us. Otherwise, our perspective is just, we were talking about this a little bit earlier today, our perspective is just, if you can envision a bubble that basically goes over us and around us as far as we can see, that's our perspective. I'm 49 years old, that's been my perspective for 49 years. Sometimes there's a computer screen in that bubble or a TV in that bubble that gives me a little bit of insight to something else. But really, my perspective is just limited to what has immediately surrounded me as I've walked through my life. And if we limit our surroundings within that bubble to people who are exactly like us, um, you know, our normal is going to be infinitely less rich than it's going to be uh, when we surround it with more diversity. And it is critical as a society if we're going to move forward. And you think about some of the big issues that we're talking about today in your country and in my country and around the world. Um, you know, our normal needs to include people who are, are different from us and have different views from us. Uh, John Wooden once said, uh, you know, in his Keys to Success, uh, um, uh, former UCLA, because I'm in good territory here, former UCLA coach who I quote all the time, you know, uh, to surround yourself with people, uh, with, with uh, strong people who will argue with you, you know. We're stronger when we, when we surround ourselves with people who have a little bit of a different viewpoint. And so um, thank you for taking the time to kind of listen to me. And, and hopefully, we can uh, do some Q&A now. And if you have any questions at all, um, look forward to, to answering anything I can. So thank you so much. I was just wondering what happened exactly with the UN going to the, that is, what did the UN do? Or I'd never heard of that. The, so the UN General Assembly is every year, every year in September for a couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that question the value of what happens there at times, uh, and people have different perspectives. But um, it, it is an opportunity where world leaders come together and, and have conversations about you know what we can do together. 
And so, uh, you know, we had, in this, this case, an opportunity to meet with the spouses of, I think, 20 spouses of world leaders at, uh, at this uh, um, meeting. And, uh, you know, what exactly happens with those countries. I know that Autism Speaks does a lot of outreach with the countries and with autism organizations on the ground in those countries to try and uh, help them move forward based on some of these relationships. But if you can get champions within the countries, um, that's immensely helpful. And who better to be a champion than the spouse of your uh, president or prime minister? And so really that's what that's, uh, what that's all about. One of the things I'm always impressed by when I've heard you talk is uh, with Jaden, you're always looking for potential. And so, you know, I, I guess, how did he get a job at the library? I mean, what was, what, you know, why did that happen as opposed to doing other kinds of things? Well, I think that, you know, that's a really good question, right? It's, it's um, Jaden's, Jaden's God advocates hardwired into his life. So myself, his mother is, a, she's a pit bull uh, advocating for him in the best of ways. And so he's got champions that have kind of looked out for, for him through his whole life. I think that we, not everybody has those champions. Not everybody has those skill sets, just like we're talking a lot about skill sets. Not everybody has that skill set. And so people need champions. And even if you have them, you know, Jaden is not going to have his mom and I in his life for all of his life, right? Uh, if the normal course of things uh, progress, we'll be gone before he is. And every parent, every parent will tell you that the thing that keeps them awake at night is the question, what happens when we're gone, right? And if we don't hardwire into our society a heart for um, helping people, and it's not all about helping, I mean, it is about helping people, but it's not all about just helping in their interest, it's about helping in our own self-interest because there are a lot of skills and abilities that, uh, that people with autism have um, that we don't have, and we don't have enough of in our society. So. Um, it's just something that we, we have to rethink about a little bit. I think that it was terrific that you brought your daughter into it. We have a number of programs here where we deal with, um, with siblings of kids on the spectrum. And I think it's really important to look at how everyone is affected in a family. And there's so much attention focused on one child. I'm interested in how you included your daughter She's obviously done very well. What kinds of things do you do to make sure that your focus expands to both of your kids when, you're, when you have so many things that you have to focus on with one child? Yeah, you, you have to be really deliberate in, in including her. And I think you, know, you also have to recognize that not every sibling is gonna be the same and have the same experience. And I, it's unbelievable how many university students will come to me after I've done a presentation and say that they have a sibling with autism but they're their um, experience is not the same as what Janae's is or their feeling. Or someone with autism will come and they'll come up to me after a presentation and say their siblings, the way their sibling felt about them isn't the same. So every relationship is unique and every person is unique in their approach to it. I think what has worked with her is making sure that we carve out time so she and I have our own time. You know, I'm, I'm, I travel more with Jaden than I do with her. She's a second year university, so it's a little bit more difficult. And she doesn't like to fly, so that makes it a little difficult sometimes too. But we do an annual three-day ski trip every year, um, cross-country skiing. And it's just something that the two of us have done for the last five years, um, and it's her time. And so she feels like she kind of gets that time. And carving out that time, whether it's a trip or whether it's a, an evening or whether it's just paying attention to you know, dividing up the time so that you can pay attention where one person's with Jaden and one person's with her, those are things that you have to be very deliberate about. But again, not everybody's life circumstance is the same. So if you're you know, a single parent, you don't have that ability to carve out the time. And I think as societies, we, we kind of need to help people with that. Um, you know, if you think about a single parent and you can, you can hang out with uh, the individual with autism so that that single parent can spend some time with the other child, that would be really, really important, right? And again, talking about it like it's not always about the challenges. Just the way we talk about it with society, talking about that with Janae. Janae, Janae of anybody is a massive champion for Jaden because she sees his potential. Because that's the way that we've talked about it all her life, right? My question is, have you been able to implement actual legislative changes in terms of, of Canadian legislation either uh, in the past or do you have any legislation pending in the future based on your experiences? Yeah, it's a, that's a really good question. It's interesting in the context, sort of comparing the two countries. So in Canada, um, 
most of the challenges like here would re revolve around healthcare, education, social, social services. Um, in Canada, all three of those are delivered at the provincial level. I'm a federal politician. So um, we don't have the chance to implement um, specific legislation in those particular areas. Um, what we have been successful at is advocating for funding at the federal level for certain programs. Um, vocational programs, for example, there's shared jurisdiction there. And so in 2014, when, when my party was in government right now, we're in opposition. But when my party was in government in 2014, we um, were successful in, in pushing for funding for a couple of vocational related uh, areas. In 2015, we funded a Canadian Autism Partnership working group, um, subsequently not funded by the current government uh, when the working group came and presented a report. But it was really a step forward in moving the conversation forward. And what that partnership would have looked like, and again, I use the word partnership a lot because I think it's really important. Um, even though it wasn't you know, autism, most things dealing with autism aren't in the federal realm in Canada, there is room for us to take the lead in using our ability to bring people together. And so if we could fund a, a partnership of people with autism, families, autism organizations, um, you know, any stakeholder that, that works in the autism field and has an interest, um, working together to advise governments, whatever their jurisdiction, provincial, federal, municipal, on challenges or opportunities um, um, that uh, come from, uh, you know, presented by people with autism. Um, it's, it's good for society and you don't need a lot of money to do that. What you're really doing is unlocking the money at those levels of government and helping them to make informed decisions because the worst case scenario, and we've seen it happen sometimes, is a government investing a lot of money in an area, but they're not informed and they get it wrong. And then you, know, you create problems that are really hard to, to undo. And we've seen that happen a few times. So take leadership, sort of meet, meet people where they're at in terms of that decision process. You're, uh, as a father with a newly diagnosed 16-month uh, son, that was extremely touching and inspiring for me and my wife. So thank you very much. Um, I think one perspective, as a new father with son that I'm coming from with is the idea, of, I'm sure it's deep within you, is the idea of discovering, unlocking, and fostering what is within and potential that we can bring out and also in doing so contribute to family and country and people around you. So it's the concept of treatment and therapy and all the options out there, you know, nutrition, uh, speech therapy. I'm wondering what your perspective is on that uh, as far as how do we bring all this together. What I've discovered is things are so fragmented. Everyone coming from different levels of education, proposing that they grand things for you, yet they don't. And it comes kind of from what you just were talking about, building a common unified community so people aren't acting on their own. I, I'd really love to see things move forward. It's, it's hard for new parents who just are suddenly dropped into the bucket and say, okay, we've got a diagnosed son. What do I do now? On your own, you have to walk out and start digging up information here, digging up bits there, over there. Some people give me bits, other people give me other bits. It's a big challenge. I think there is a need for a go-to place that serves many. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that, I could say locally, nationwide, and internationally. So a couple of thoughts on that. So first off, you know, the Mind Institute, one of the reasons why I love being here is because I've heard of the work that the Mind Institute does everywhere I go. People have great things to say about the Mind Institute. And so, um, so I love coming here because that evidence base is really important because there's a lot of stuff that is complete wingnutry, to make up a word, I think. Um, that, but families are looking for anything and people with autism are looking for anything. And in the absence of you know, an evidence base, they'll you know, they'll, they'll chase anything that someone presents them, right, to try and help, right, make life better. And no matter where I am, 
Um, as someone that speaks as much as I do about autism, people will send me messages or phone my office, and I've got six full-time equivalent staff who handle all of this, but the number one comment that people make is they'll tell a long story, and, and often, increasingly, the people that are sending us notes are people with autism themselves saying at the end of the story, I don't know where to turn. And the reality is that in most cases, there isn't anywhere to turn. That's the scary thing is that there's not a place that you can say, here, call this number and you'll get the help you need. And we need to establish, I mean, obviously, you know, budgets are limited and governments face fiscal challenges and all of those different things, but we have so much that we can do better. And I love this organization. What I wanna do is I'm passionate and I've had lots of conversations today with experts here about how do we connect these experts with other people who are doing similar things around the world uh, in a common interest. And as it relates to common ground, I don't, you know, someone corrected me because I used to talk about speaking with one voice, right? Which I think is kind of important on the things that we agree on. And, and this researcher said, well, no, we don't all want to be speaking with one voice. We need different voices, which is true. Um, I think that we want to find the common ground and work together on those things. But if, if the ground you're on isn't common, but it might be really important, it might be new ground, whatever the case is, keep working on those. Find, find other people who are working on that ground too. But the things that we almost all agree on, we really need to push forward and work together on those things. Does that make sense? It does. It's, it's a, an element of uh, frustration. Yep. It's newly diagnosed parents. Yep. Uh, between having a new <coughs> diagnosis and then having to deal with that again. Nothing is established. Mm -hmm. So I say, if you go through your health care system, you have yep. So let me throw this to you though. I'll throw this to you because you're dealing with a new diagnosis yourself, right? This is, you're in this place right now and you need help. I guarantee you when, uh, it's Owen, right, is your son? When, when Owen is 22, you'll have different things that he's challenged with, you know, and this is common, not just people with autism, everybody has challenges that they face at different times in their life and at that point, your family specifically will be consumed with those challenges at 22. As a community, what's important is that we, we realize that autism is lifelong and there's a whole lifespan of issues and we need to work together on those issues as, as one in a sense on the things that we agree on, knowing that there's different people at different places in that lifespan and if we help move awareness and policy in all of the areas, we're helping everybody. And most importantly, again, helping society. Society will be stronger for that. The two of you just had a dialogue that was interesting to me and I wanted to point out some, some uh, concepts that you shared. You were talking about um, unlocking your son's potential. But I think, Mike, what I hear you talking about isn't unlocking a potential, it's observing skills that were coming out right there around you, that it was in Jaden and in the environment that he was growing up in. And, a, a parents observing children and seeing their strengths is what leads to jobs and leads to skills and leads to literacy. And I think one of the messages you've shown is that you can trust the child to show the parent what they're good at and what they're interested in. Um, we don't, it isn't like we have to find a magic key. The family and the experiences are the magic keys and we have to listen. And I thank you for sharing that. Absolutely, and, and I'll comment on that, first of all, I love the, the work that you're doing, and I'm, I'm, out, I'm out to Duke in a couple of months to see Jerry and the, the, the work going on there too, so that'll be kind of interesting. Um, one of the aha moments, I think, for me, and I shared this a little bit with a few folks today, over the last couple of years, is the you know, initiative shown by self-advocates talking about things like self-determination and those things. And I've had a hard time getting my head sometimes around that because you know, the, the hardest core advocates for that will talk about full self-determination. And I, as I shared today, you know, with Jaden, if you let him fully self-determine, he probably wouldn't survive the day because he would go to, you know, see a dog across the street or decide he wants to go swimming and probably have difficulty navigating the traffic and all the things that come with that. But it's really started to make me think about what does maximum self-determination? It's really challenged me because too often over Jaden's life, we haven't observed enough 
we've stepped in and tried to do things for him. We've completely, even as his parents underestimated him. So we don't let him finish a sentence on his computer because we're impatient. We want to get on to things. And we don't let him make decisions and learn from the decisions he's making. And I think you know, this is an area where that observation that you talk about, um, you know, it, it, it's something that we're learning still, uh, how to observe him not only for what he's good at, but for what he wants, too and try and allow him to choose his own path as much as we can. And when we do that, we're finding that more and more we're seeing things that we didn't even think were possible. And the singing, the singing thing, you know, there was a time you'd be singing the national anthem at a sporting event, Jaden would make a little bit of noise and you'd shush him because you, you, know, you thought he was distracting and people were gonna think it was disrespectful. Well, we're realizing now when he starts to make noise during a national anthem, he's singing. He'll start when we start and he'll finish when we finish. And a few people around will look and be put off by this disrespectful kid, you know, but it only takes them a few seconds to realize that Jaden's actually standing with his hands by his side and he's singing in his own way. And then, you know, so we used to stop that. Now we've kind of learned to observe it and realize what it actually is. I was wondering if I could pick your brain a bit about a conversation we were having in my laboratory today. We have a young man who's actually a participant in one of our studies. We study lifespan development in autism. He's a young adult. And uh, we uh, learned really early that he had interest in possibly helping us with data entry. And he's volunteered with us now for the last two years. And he is amazing with data entry. So watching pictures of Jaden uh, sorting library books, it was striking to see how this individual, his minimal, he's minimally verbal, but he just enters data quicker than anyone else. And with my RAs, we, RAs were telling me today, about 95% accuracy. And requires a little supervision, but really not a lot. So we were engaged in a conversation about what we can do to help him to do more in our lab and to try to think about things that he also might be good at. So I was wondering if you had any suggestions for us, other things that you might have noticed in Jaden, because it seems like the two are somewhat similar, or even in other people with autism who have great gifts that we may not be able to recognize and how they might be put to use in a laboratory setting or any job setting. I'm going to answer that question maybe more broadly than you're even putting it. Um, I, I have, uh, first of all, with Jaden in the library, we recognize still Jaden's not working right now in the library. It's a few years after that, and he's in a life skills kind of program right now, learning some life skills, because there are some challenges that you kind of need to mitigate. When Jaden putting books away um, in a big library with a cart, he'll run over people with the cart. He's so excited to put the books away, but people are just speed bumps to him, right? And so uh, he doesn't recognize that. So you kind of got to work to mitigate some of those challenges. So you start to envision, okay, well, what could he need some supervision, so what would that look like? And oftentimes with contribution, this is not answering your question at all, but it gives me a, I, an opportunity to say a few things. With contribution, the way I think about it with Jaden is if Jaden and another person can contribute more than the other person could contribute on their own, then Jaden is adding something. If you have to take someone and attach them to Jaden to do field trips for his whole life, then you're dealing with a different situation. And Jaden has more to offer, I think, in a sense, than that. So structuring something in a library, for example, where you would have five people like Jaden, it could work in a warehouse or whatever the case is, structuring something where you have five people with that same kind of skill set, maybe a few of the same challenges that need to be mitigated, with one person who oversees them, you're going to unlock huge potential in that sense, right? You're going to wind up with, because he's so good at that. So thinking about structure, thinking about the way that you do things in your office that you might be able to adapt a little bit, um, to take advantage of the skills and abilities, right? Um, you guys are probably, most of you would be familiar with Walgreens and the example of Walgreens, so as it relates to autism. How many of you are familiar with Walgreens? And so Randy Lewis, former vice president in charge of distribution, son with autism, he's in charge of their entire distribution center. And rather than try and find a place to fit his son into their system, he turned everything upside down. They were building a new distribution center, and he thought, what if we structured our distribution center around the unique skills and abilities that people like my son have? And they built a distribution center brand new that was completely functionally different than their other distribution centers. And 40%, I think, of the employees in that distribution center had autism or a similar developmental disability. 
and it's their highest performing distribution center. At, was their highest, as, as of the last time I checked, their highest performing distribution center in the entire network because they thought differently about the way that they structured things. So, so often we try and fit someone into a role as opposed to fitting the role and the job around them. The last thing I'll add to that is just the fact that when people are adding value, and you know, I come from a world where we have lots of volunteers come in, um, one of the things that we're trying to get our heads around within my office is when do we pay people and when do we have them volunteer? And too often, people with autism wind up volunteering for things that they actually should be paid at. And so I've got a, uh, I've got a uh, um, young lady who volunteers in, vol started volunteering in my office. She has a master's degree. Started volunteering in my office and I went to my team and she was working, th coming three hours a week. And I started talking like, is she good at what she does? Are we getting value for the work that she's doing? Because I want to pay someone for something they're not good at, but the answer I got was yes. And I said, well, why aren't we paying her then? Three, three hours a week is not, we can pay for three hours a week. And now she's working six hours a week and we're looking for ways to, to sort of have her do more things. Yeah, right. Yeah. So the cool thing with Courtney, who's doing this role in my office is, we do a lot of autism outreach. I do a lot of autism work, so my team I have a person who does outreach to universities and to autism organizations because we want to build a network of autism organizations that we're aware of and are aware of what we're doing as we work on our thing. Courtney started doing outreach to self-advocate groups. She's a self-advocate, right? And so who better to do, advocate, you know, to, to, to do the outreach than a self-advocate themselves? And uh, it, it's doing, she's doing really, really well at it. And uh, it's, it's been fantastic. So it's not just self-advocate groups, she's reaching out to autism groups, but uh, um, it's, it's fantastic. Again, we're now pushing her, just like we push everybody in the office to do more and to see what she's capable of, and she's proving that she's capable of more than we might have expected. Yeah, my name is Arthur, and I hope I'm not, I hope I'm not the only one in this room who has, who's on the spectrum. No, I don't think you are. There's, I think, at least, I know there's at least two other people. All right, so I'm glad I'm not the only one in the spectrum, and right now I'm sort of a very much impressed, very much impressed, first, but you're, you're sort of fantastic, must be a fantastic father. You don't see too many, you know, you need to see a lot more of those. And also, I, uh, belong, I belong to some groups that help each other uh, find each other jobs. And on the spectrum, and we, uh, it's a social club, it's called Ascent. You know, I'm sure you're aware of that in San Francisco. And it's a group of uh, adults who help each other find, each other, uh, help each social and uh, other activities. And uh, I'd like to, and anyway, I just sort of have you know that I um, appreciate your speech, and again, thanks for being such a good father. Oh, thank you. Uh. <laughs>